11 down to verse uh, number 10. Truly that uh, grace, grace is, grace is the answer. Let's turn with me in your Bibles. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse number 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And for this thing, I bethought the Lord thrice, three times, that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, would I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasures in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Let's just look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Gracious God, as we come before you, we thank you again for the word of God that we possess for these words. We know that these are truly your words. Help us, God, to apply these words in our lives so that we might be living for you. We pray in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. So as we begin looking at, really, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 9 and 10, and saying that grace is the answer, by, by way of introduction, so this is kind of a, a background to what we want to talk about. Let's just talk for a moment. I mean, we sing the song, Amazing Grace, right? Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And I'm just thinking, wow, you said, wow, he knew the whole first stanza from heart. That's pretty good. <laughs> anyway, so it's God's amazing grace. First of all, when you think about it, God's grace saves us, right? This is how amazing God's grace is. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you don't have to turn there, but for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, it's not of works as any man should boast. So we're saved by God's grace, and that grace that saves us, we, we, we can... Shout with John Newton, that is amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. I was, I was, we were in darkness. And then we saw the light of the truth of the gospel. We responded by that, and God saved us and gave us eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is marvelous grace, right? That, that's amazing grace. And salvation is not through religious activities, not because of water baptism or something else or prayer or giving money or trying to be a good person because that, that's a good work. And we know what Romans chapter 4, verse 4 and 5 talk about, that it's to the person who works not, verse 5, but believeth on him that justified the ungodly. His, his faith is counted for righteousness. And so we rejoice in that uh, saving grace. And then we know that God's grace teaches us how, how are we to live today in function in the dispensation of God's grace? You know the verse of Scripture, but if you want to turn there to Titus chapter number 2. Titus chapter number 2, beginning here at verse number 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us, and again, if I were to ask you, what teaches us denying ungodliness and worldly lust that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world? What teaches us? It's the grace of God from verse number 11, right? It's the grace of God that teaches us. So God's grace teaches us how we ought to live. And again, if you, if you compare law or grace, and I've said this many times, but I will say it again, you make a choice. And if you, if you have the law and you add a little grace to it, you no longer have the law. And if you have grace and you add a little law to it, you, know, you no longer have grace. It's not really law and grace, it's law or grace. Make a choice. And if you want the law, go back to what Deuteronomy 28 says. There's a blessing side of the law, but people don't want to talk about it. Beginning in verse 14, verse 15, there's what? There's a curse side of the law. And if you don't keep all the law, these, these are the curses that are going to come on you. Well, when we talk about God's, God's grace teaching us, 
And there are people who are going to object and say that, well, then you're saying, you know, God's, you're making God's grace cheap and then you're saying that you could live any. No, no, salvation is by grace through faith. And we are eternally secure in God, eternally secure in Christ now at the moment of our salvation and throughout all eternity, right? Praise God. So God then, grace teaches us how we ought to live. And we know that God's grace also keeps us. Keeps us eternally secure. We see that over in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. But if you go back to Ephesians, and if you go to the second chapter, we can say this about God's grace in eternity. As you read Ephesians, and as I read it and you follow along with me, what do we see here about God's grace? Well, we'll begin reading in verse number 4. And again, you love this portion of Scripture because verses 1 to 3... Pastor Aaron shared uh, recently, preached from this portion of Scripture recently. When you read verses 1 to 3, this is the way we were. We were the walking dead. And what, several years ago, we ran a series of messages, the walking dead. And there was a young man who came here. Well, you know, because what, you know, what do they do about the walking dead? Because, you know, it's a TV series or whatever. That's beyond me. But the walking dead. Those are people who are alive physically. They, they, can, they can function. They have the breath of life. But remember, what is death? Separation. And there's more than physical death. There's spiritual death. And then there's what? The eternal death. Being eternally separated from God. The, the, the walking dead. And you see that when you read verses 1 through verse 3. Don't you love verse 4? What are the first two words of Ephesians 2, 4? But God. Not but man. Not but my, my religion. Not by my good works. Not by my prayers. Not by my money. My offerings. And all these things. It's but God who is rich in mercy for his great love where he loved us. Verse 5 and 6, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace you are saved, hath raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. We're already, believers are already seated in the heavenly places in Christ, right? That's our position. What does verse 7 say? That in the ages to come he might show the What? Riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. What does that tell us about God's grace in eternity? It keeps going and going. It's better. It's better. If you want to say God's grace that saves us is great, right? God's grace that keeps us and teaches us is greater. The greatest is still coming. Because the, the viewpoint, and Sharon was, was saying this, that in the ages to come... And it's, it's, the coming, it's the coming ages. It's the ages that keep rolling one after the other. The illustration, for those who have, you know, our family likes to uh, go down to Rodanthe, to the Outer Banks. I don't care what time of day, afternoon, evening, night. What's going to be constant when you go to the ocean? There's going to be waves coming. You may not be able to see them if you're there at 2 o'clock in the morning or late at night or 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning before the sunrise. But one thing is for certain, you're going to hear them. And they just keep coming one after the other after the other. Well, that, that's the viewpoint here. In Ephesians 2, 7, it's, it's that in the ages to come, plural, the coming ages, the ones that are going to keep rolling one after the other after the other. We love amazing grace. And when you look to the last stanza, when we've been there how many years? 10,000 10, years, bright shining as the sun, we've last days to sing God's praise and when we first begun. And I, I've shared this. And people say, well, I don't think that's what he's really saying. And I always attributed to John Newton, but actually someone else wrote that last stanza. After 10,000 years in day one or two, is eternity going to stop? No. No. So he could, have, he could have written, well, we've been there 10 million years, a million years. I mean, 10,000 was a big number by back then. It's... We won't go down there, but it's nothing today, right? We hear millions and trillions. So the issue is, when we've been there throughout all eternity, that in the ages to come, the ages that are going to keep rolling one after the other after the other, he might show not just the riches of his grace, but God has to use a superlative here. He might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us, through Christ Jesus. So first of all, God's grace. 
it saves us. Us and God's grace in eternity is only going to get better and better and better, right? Praise God. We are eternally secure. And then there are going to be people, when you talk about God's grace, what are they going to say? They're going to say, well, you, you, you're just giving people license to sin. What's our answer? Romans chapter 6. Shall man continue in sin that God's grace may abound? What's the answer? God forbid. We're dead to sin. We, we have complete identification with Christ. That's Romans 6, 3, and 4. That's the Holy Spirit of God baptizing us into the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, and we've been raised to, how does verse 4 end up? To walk in newness of life. That's what teaches us how we ought to be living for God. Now, let's just talk about the chronological order of the 13 Pauline epistles. 13. Romans over to Philemon, not, not the book of Hebrews, it's not 14. And I have, there's, a, I think there's some there at the Resource Center, if you'd like. But it, it tries to explain the difference between, and, and when I say this, I always have to preface this. There's a difference between the chronological order and the canonical order, Right? We say, what's the canonical order? The canonical order is the canon of Scripture. In the Gospels, it's going to start Romans all the way to Philemon, right? That's the canonical order. And this has nothing to do with inspiration. So please, if you're listening, watching, you're here in the auditorium, do not leave here and say, well, the pastor does not believe in the Word of God and the divine inspiration of God's Scripture, because that's incorrect. I do believe that. I believe with all my heart, soul, and mind that these words are God's words. God gave the words to the writers. It's not what Paul or Mark or John say. This, this, is, God talk, this is God speaking to us today. But when you realize and you study and you figure things out, there's a, there's a difference. It has nothing to do with 2 Timothy 3, 16, that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God because scripture is God-breathed. So I'll just for a moment, just talk about the chronological order. The chronological order differs from the canonical order. The canonical order starts with Romans, which it should, because that's all about the cross and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul, God raised up Paul. He is the apostle of the Gentiles, the body of Christ. Acts 13 and 28, there are six epistles that God wrote through Paul. First and second Thessalonians, first and second Corinthians, Galatians, Romans. Then we know that the desire to go to Jerusalem, he goes to Jerusalem. He, he's in trouble there. The Romans intercede. He's arrested. He spends two years in Caesarea, and because he appealed to Caesar, two years he is sent over into Rome itself while he's imprisoned. Isn't this amazing? While he has a Roman soldier handcuffed, chained to him for 24 hours a day for two full years, what does, God, what does Paul do through God? Not only does he preach the gospel, but God, he writes four epistles, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. Then I call this his freedom. He's released. And see, this means a lot to me because, you know, he could have complained to God and said, God, you know, I'm just going to hide out in a corner. What does he do? He, he, he goes out. And that's where, if you go to the book of Titus and he says to Titus about ordaining elders in every city on the, in the country of Crete. It's still there today. That does not correspond to anything in the book of Acts. And so he writes 1 Timothy and Titus and the second and final Roman uh, imprisonment is one epistle, 2 Timothy, because what's going to happen to Paul after 2 Timothy? He's going to be martyred. And because he is a Roman citizen, and we find this out in Acts 16, they cannot crucify him, so he was beheaded and as a martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we look at this, what, what, why is this important to understand the chronological order of the scriptures, at least where they fit? So I know that Romans and 1st and 2nd Corinthians and 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and Galatians fits in somewhere between Acts 13 to Acts 28. Why is it important? Rightly dividing. Why? Acts 13, or excuse me, over in 1st Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, what do they talk about? Tongues. Tongues. 
And people will say, if you want to be Pauline? It's right there. And I've shared with you, and I'm not going to go back to that illustration, but I not haunts me, but I still remember it. Going to back when I was a young believer and you know, attending a local college. And the person basically came along, and, and they, they knew my position. I didn't understand they knew my position. The guy looks right at me and says, well, some of you don't believe in this. Well, just look at 12, 13, and 14 as a hamburger. And 12 and 14 are the buns, and 13 is the meat. I don't like the meat, so I throw it out, and I eat 12 and 14. I was 19, year, 19, 20 years old, and it's like, well, first of all, I'm Scottish, so I'm not going to throw out a hamburger. <laughs> Secondly, you're talking about God's holy word. It's because he couldn't understand the 13th chapter. So he wanted tongues 12, 14, but he didn't want to deal with the 13th chapter. So I give you many more illustrations, but this is why it is important to, to understand how this fits in. And I when we turn to 2 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians chapter 12 begins by saying, Paul is talking about this, I will come in the visions and revelation of the Lord. There's this man in the body, out of the body, I cannot tell. He was caught away to paradise. He was caught away to the third heaven. And he heard and saw things, but it was unlawful for him to write. The, the individual is who? It's Paul himself. And he's going to come into visions and revelations of the Lord. And as we begin reading in verse number 9, he said unto me, there's the audible voice of God. But when I understand where that fits in, in God's program, we do not have a complete scripture. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Various ways of God communicating with truth. And I didn't do all, share all of them. I mean, obviously one is, Paul, pick up a pen and start writing. You can think of... Um, Jeremiah 36. In Jeremiah 36, God gives the words to Jeremiah. And who does Jeremiah dictate the words of the book of Jeremiah to? What's the man's name? Baruch. And he starts writing. And he, has a, he, he writes the book of Jeremiah. And he says, you know, I don't have much favor with the king, so I'm going to give it to you and you go to the king. What did the king do with the book? The Bible. God, God's holy word. Here's the king of Israel. And what is Romans chapter 3 says? What advantage are Jews chiefly in every way because they had what? They had the miracles. Of, this is God's word. And what did the king do? He took out his pen knife and, and threw it in a fireplace and burnt, burnt God's word. What did God do? Jeremiah, let's rewrite the thing. Because <laughs> God has preserved his word today in the 21st century. As you're looking and reading God's word, believe, understand, rest in the understanding. This is God's word. God loves me and cares so much for us that he has not only given his word by inspiration, that it's God breathed. And again, remember 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And the word inspiration is made up of two words in the Greek language, God breathed. God and breath. It doesn't mean, oh, I read, you know, I read through the book of Genesis and in the book of Genesis talking about all these people killing each other. That doesn't really sound very inspiring to me. That's not what inspiration means. What inspiration means is that when you read the word of God, I don't care where you're reading it, as long as it's in the 66 books of the Bible, between Genesis and Revelation, you're reading what? God's Word. It's not what Paul says, Mark, John, to me, they said nothing. It's, these are God's words. And so God's various ways of communicating his truth, obviously, was direct communication also through dreams, trances, visions. And that's what, he, what the Apostle Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. When he says, it's not expedient for me, doubtless the glory, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. He, he, he didn't get it all. He did not receive all the message. And you think of uh, dreams. Nebuchadnezzar had a, a dream. And we, we've, we've talked about uh, that dream, but how important is Daniel chapter number two? So important, critically important, understanding God's prophetic program. Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And why did Nebuchadnezzar have the dream? It's because he, wanted, he, he thought he had a forever kingdom. And I've shared this. 
the king, he didn't forget his dream. If you have a Schofield, they'll, they'll, people will say he forgot the dream. He didn't forget his dream. I'm sure I've, I've went around the congregation and asked, do you still remember some dreams, you know, nightmares you had as a kid? I can still, still remember a few of them. The, the issue ultimately is he didn't forget the dream. It's he put his wise men, the, the Babylonians, the sorcerers, the soothsayers to, ta- to the test and said, oh, hey guys, I, got, I had a dream last night. You tell me the dream. And if you tell me the dream, I'll know what you tell me. The interpretation is true. He said, tell us a dream and we'll tell you the interpretation. He said, no, I want you to tell me. This thing is gone from me. What went from him was an edict. You tell me the dream so I'll know that when you give me the interpretation of truth, they said, no one could do this. And if you read through this, you will see those Chaldeans, the soothsayers who, who are supposed to be interpreters of dreams, never, ever, ever turn to their God for any help. Daniel gets wind of this because Daniel has three friends. And we know by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but they had Jewish names because their parents were godly. And they were taken out in the first deportation. And immediately they they pray to God. And God reveals to Daniel that night. Because remember, the the edict that went forth from the king is, you can't do this, what am I going to do with you? You, I'm going to kill you all. And Marduk is going, um, Arioch rather, is going around and he's he's ready to start being the executor. To execute these people. And Daniel and his three friends would have been in that room. And God reveals it. And he even tells Daniel why he, he... Nebuchadnezzar had a dream because he wanted to know what was going to happen to his kingdom. And King Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. Babylon is what modern day country? Iraq. Yeah. What's going to happen to your country? And he is told in, in the dream that great image of gold. And it goes to silver and the brass. And the brass, it goes to iron, it goes to part iron and it goes down and there's this rock, this stone that's cut without man's hand, smites the image and the image is pulverized and the rock becomes a great mountain and fills the whole earth and that rock is Lord Jesus, the stone is Lord Jesus Christ. Second coming. Daniel, a teenager, standing in front of the tyrant, tells him what he dreamt, what it meant. This teenager had to tell him, you think you have a forever kingdom? This is modern day. You think you have a forever kingdom? Your kingdom is going down. Your kingdom is going to be conquered by an inferior kingdom, which it was. It was conquered by the Medes and Persians. And if you read Daniel 5, Daniel's there when when that happens. So God used dreams, trances, visions, obviously direct, um, direct communication. And the apostle Paul did not receive all the message of God's word at one time. That's why he says here, I'm coming to visions and revelations of the Lord. And he goes, if you, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. Out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows the one such as one was caught up to the third heaven. Now, remember, there are groups who teach that there are three different heavens. Are there three different heavens? Like there's a really good heaven, there's a middle heaven, and then the third one's not so good, and if you can't make one, two, or three, you're going to hell. Is that scriptural? No, you can't say no, that's not. We, we, we know that we have here where, where, we, where the birds are, that's considered the first heaven, out, outer space. Where the stars are is the second, then you deal with the throne room of God, you deal with the third heaven. And Paul didn't know. I knew a man, I don't know, why not? Because I believe he heard things and he saw things. And he was caught up in the paradise and verse goes on in verse four and heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for man to utter. That's why you don't find all this information about heaven. Why? Because God, didn't, God did not want Paul to write this down. But I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. But today in the dispensation of God's grace, if you will go over with me to Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to get back to 2 Corinthians. We're not going to get through all this morning. But it's a powerful portion of scripture when you, under, when you understand and think about what's, go, what's going on. Colossians chapter, uh, yeah. Colossians chapter 1 and beginning here. In verse number uh, 20, 24, 25. 
who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind in the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to what? What are those last words? To fulfill the word of God. What, what, what completes the word of God? Paul. Paul's message. The, the book of Revelation, whether you believe it was written in 95 AD or earlier, the book of Revelation does not complete the word of God. The book of Revelation is an Old Testament book. Putting in somewhat chronological order the events dealing with what? The tribulation time into the kingdom. And then great white throne judgment, new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. And unfortunately, that's where people get a lot of their description from heaven, and that's why you, you see it have crept into the hymns from the new Jerusalem. That's not, not even heaven. That's the new Jerusalem dealing with the streets of gold. That, that's not a description, that's not a description of, of heaven. So here we find out, which is given to me for you to fulfill, to complete the very word of God. So today in the dispensation of grace, we have what? We have a complete Bible. So we're going to be studying a verse that begins saying that God, God said, and we would say, that's the audible voice of God. But today, or even later, after God completed the scriptures through the Apostle Paul, is there an audible voice of God? No, we, we have a complete scripture. That's the point. If you go back to 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, we have an absolute complete scripture. And so we begin looking here and talking upon the audible voice of God. But this is during the Acts period. That's why I spent a few moments. That's why, if you ask me, why is it important to understand the, diff the chronological order of the 13 Pauline epistles? Even if you get my chart and you say, well, I, I, I believe First and Second Thessalonians is first, and someone's going to say, no, I think it's great. At least the general time that they were written. So those six are somewhere between Acts 13 to Acts 28. And there's things that are happening during that time. Tons. Why? Because they don't have a complete scripture. When we have a complete scripture, these things pass away. And that's the issue of now and then. And there's a chart on that. That's 1 Corinthians 13, what that man didn't understand. As I said, I still think of that illustration. and want to say, how dare somebody saying, well, understand this chapter so I'm just going to discard it. No, it's God's word. Understand it. Rightly divide the word of truth and see what God is saying here. So we talk upon the audible voice of God and we see this beginning in verse number uh, 7 in, or verse number 8 into verse number 9. And notice what we read here. Because in verse 8, for this thing, this thorn in the flesh, I besought the Lord thrice, three times that it might depart from me. Right? We just we sang the hymn, 220, right? Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer. That, that bids me from this world of... Right? And Paul is saying, I pray three times. And he said to me, here's an audible voice of God. But I understand when it's written. It's written during the Acts. I don't have a complete scripture. That's why the gift of tongues. That's why they also had the gift of interpretation, right? And if you go back and read 1 Corinthians 12 and into the 14th chapter, if someone came to church and had the gift of tongues and the person who had the gift of interpretation was homesick, what, did the, what should the person who spoke in tongues do that day? Be quiet. Be quiet. Why? Because the person who has the gift of interpretation isn't there. And people who would come in, and part of our recent trip, we, we were at Corinth. And you could see why that this was a commercial center. Later on, Greek would, Greece would build the, a canal, be, uh, it's the Isthmus of Corinth. And there's one bay called the Bay of Corinth and the other ocean, not sure what it's called, and that leads out into the Aegean Sea. So you can understand, Corinth was a, an important city where the gospel was going to go be spread in the southern part of, of Greece. And so the issue here was, as you come to this verse of Scripture, the audible voice of God, because like 1 Corinthians, that's what we said, and someone said, we have to, we have to write the divide with the Paul's epistles. I, I, I will 
acknowledge to you 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 and 13. But also in the 13th chapter, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And that's not a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, though we understand he did not sin, he could not have sinned because he is God. So here we have the audible voice of God because we don't have a complete scripture. It's, it's, it's not after the writing of uh, Second Timothy. It's during the Acts period. So we have this audible voice. And he said to me, and again, the context is, it's thrown in the flesh three times. God, aren't I supposed to pray about it? Yeah, you're supposed to pray. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So God's great. That's why we began talking about God's grace, if you didn't understand the connection. God's grace is great, right? God's grace saves us. God's grace keeps us. Are you looking forward to the eternity future and the ages to come? They're going to keep rolling one after the other, after the other, after the other. And he's going to show the exceeding riches of his grace. And it's going to be even greater. But until that time comes, we live in the dispensation of grace. Isn't God's grace helping us, keeping us, guarding us, and helping us through our daily issues of life and grace? Grace is the unmerited, undeserved favor besto bestowed upon those people who really who des only deserve his judgment. Some have said grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. God's grace. It is the unmerited favor of God and, and, and undeserved. And because of God's grace, we're saved by God's grace alone through faith. Not through religion, not through religious activities, not because we're good and so many people want to trust. Well, I, I haven't been a bad person. I've really never murdered anybody, so I, I get to heaven. That, that's not salvation. It's through what Christ has done for us on the cross of Christ. And he says that my grace is sufficient for thee. Here's Webster's Dictionary definition of 1828 of sufficient, equal to the end, proposed, adequate to wants, competent. And then we realize, what does the word antonym mean? Opposites. So we're not giving synonyms of sufficient, we're giving antonyms. Look at some of those antonyms of sufficient, insufficient, unacceptable, deficient, inadequate, lacking. Do you see? God's grace is sufficient. It's not insufficient. It's not inadequate. It's not lacking. It is what? It is sufficient for all things. That's what, that's what he is saying. And real quickly, notice what God did not say. God did not say when you read it. So Paul prays about the thorn in the flesh. He bethought the Lord three times that it might depart. Paul, Paul's human, like we are. He's going through great difficulty and, and at Philippi, he's beaten, yet at midnight, him, Paul, and Silas prayed and gave praises and sang hymns to God. God does not say when you read this, therefore, or excuse me, verse 9, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for thee. God did not say the thorn in the flesh would be immediately removed, right? God, God didn't even give him an explanation. Paul could have been saying, God, I'm the apostle of the Gentiles, and I have this thorn in the flesh. Some people feel maybe it was his eyesight. Or another weakness. God didn't give him an explanation, right? He doesn't explain to him, well, Paul, this is, wh this is why I'm not going to do this. He simply gave him a promise that his grace is sufficient for thee. Praise God for that. God gave Paul's grace for his thorn in the flesh, and there will never be a shortage of God's grace, right? Because Romans 5 says, where sin abounds, the grace of God does what? Much more abound. And the original language, much more abound, is one word. It's a compound word. has a preposition in front of it and then the word. And it literally means what? Super. Super abounding grace today. And that super abounding of God's grace today is only going to multiply and even if it's, it's possible. And you might be scratching your head at this and I'm just going to share. Out in, out in eternity, out in the eternal future, God's grace is what? Even going to superabound even more. Can we understand that? No, I'm just telling you what Ephesians 2, 7 says. And that we can rejoice in it. 
So we have so much to be thankful for. We're going to continue looking at this. But he, I would encourage you to read and memorize verse 9 and verse number 10 and think about God's grace in our lives right now. It's, it's marvelous that it saves us. It's marvelous that it's even going to get better. But th this, is, this is, right? This is the here and now. So we go through difficulty in his life. My grace is sufficient for thee. If it was sufficient for the Apostle Paul, isn't it sufficient for you and for me today, right? Praise God for that. If you've never trusted Christ, you're watching over TV or Facebook or the radio, you've never trusted him. The only way of salvation, the only way is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on him and thou shalt be saved. And for us who are saved, it is about God's grace. God's grace keeps us. It saves us. It keeps us. It teaches us. It's going to get better. But it sustains us during times of difficulty. My grace is sufficient for thee. Let's just look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Our eternal God, we thank you again for Lord Jesus Christ and for all that he means to us, for what he has given us. We thank you for your grace. And God, if there's anyone listening that does not know thee as their personal Savior, we pray, God, that they would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ before it's eternally too late. And us who are saved, God, we know, help us to realize and just rejoice that your grace is sufficient. We pray in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll turn in your hymn books and stand as uh, Brandon and the musicians return, hymn 238, I Must Tell Jesus. You have been listening to the morning worship service of the Altoona Bible Church. We trust that you received a real spiritual blessing from this morning's broadcast. It is our prayerful desire that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. So until we meet again, this is Pastor Stuart McClellan from the Altoona Bible Church wishing you God's best for now and throughout all eternity.